in 15 minutes or so, so I don't keep you from at least having some champagne, I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction to one piece of science that we have done in my lab. And, and I hope that I can at least make the point that it's illustrative of the sort of science that goes on at the Salk Institute. So I titled this talk, Taming the Immune System, because uh, as Rebecca uh, mentioned in her introduction, um, this work <clears throat> in my lab over the last 10 years or so relates to how immune responses are controlled. Um, I'm telling this story mainly because <clears throat> we came to this science more or less through serendipity. It wasn't something we set out to study. It's something we discovered by happenstance. And as I said, I think that's an illustration of the kind of thing that happens in the immune system. This is uh, salmonella. So you've probably heard about these stories about contamination of eggs with salmonella and the problem that sal salmonella causes. This is sort of a pathogen that's in the news right now. Here's a pathogen that was in the news um, almost exactly a year ago. This is a flu virus. In fact, it's the H1N1 swine flu virus. So a year ago, folks were very concerned about this guy. Um, both of these creatures uh, are threats to you. And your immune system is designed to protect you against them. And you have some very, very effective means of fighting off pathogens like that bacteria and this virus. However, once you have defeated the swine flu virus or salmonella, you have to turn that response off. Otherwise, you're going to spend pretty much the rest of your life um, in this configuration. Because this is someone actually responding to, to H1N1. Um, we, about 10 years ago, uh, discovered a set of receptors that basically prevent you from staying in this state forever. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, these receptors are called TAM receptors. And the name comes from really the th just the first letter of the three receptors that are in the family, Tyro3, Axel, and Mer, T-A-M. They, they are these red molecules here. They sit on the surface of your cells important cells in your immune system called dendritic cells and macrophages. They're of a set of molecules called tyrosine kinases that were actually discovered here at the Salk Institute by Tony Hunter. These uh, um, receptors or these kinds of molecules, these tyrosine kinases, are very important switches in your cells. They control a whole series of processes. So my lab actually discovered these guys, these TAM receptors, actually a number of years ago now. And for the longest time, we really didn't know what they were doing. So we did what many biologists do in this setting, or many people who are investigating a process. We took these receptors away from animals, from experimental animals. We did so-called gene knockouts. And we made mice that didn't have the receptors. And we asked what happened to the mice. They didn't have any of the receptors. So we actually made mice that had no Tyro-3, no Axel, and no Merck. When those mice were born, they were fine. But a few weeks after they were born, they started to develop a whole series of phenotypes that looked like autoimmune diseases in people. So their lymph nodes got to be very, very large. So these are these mutants, these TAM, TKO stands for triple knockout, so no TAMs. This is the size of their lymph nodes relative to wild type. These are not tumors. They're just enormous lymph nodes. This is the size of their spleen relative to a normal wild-type mouse that has all the TAM receptors. And in all their tissues, these small little blue dots here are colonies of activated lymphocytes. So this is in a liver of one of these mice. But basically, we found these cells everywhere in the mice. The mice went on to develop very broad-spectrum autoimmune disease. So their this is, this is one of the feet of these mice. Their joints and their foot pads became very swollen, phenotypes very similar to rheumatoid arthritis, which is a human autoimmune disease. They developed this blistering skin disease like autoimmune psoriasis. They had antibody deposits, IgG deposits, in many of their tissues, including their kidney. This is a symptom that's very, very common in lupus in humans. This is another autoimmune disease. And if you looked in their blood, I won't go through this, 
you found that they were making antibodies against their own tissue. So this is an example. They were making antibodies against their own DNA. So their immune systems were making a fundamental mistake. The immune system is supposed to be able to tell you from everything else that's foreign. It's supposed to protect you from salmonella and H1N1. Instead, these mice, their immune systems were attacking their own tissues. This is what an autoimmune disease happens. And what we figured out over the years is that is, is this reflects the fact that they don't have these TAM receptors, and we figured out what the TAM receptors are doing in these mice. We started studying these originally because I was a neurobiologist, and I wanted to under, I, and the, some of the TAMs are expressed in the brain. We didn't even know that they were expressed in the immune system, but it turns out that they are. And in the immune system, they're in these kind of cells. They're in cells called dendritic cells and macrophages, which are sentinels. They're cells in all your tissues in your body, and they're on the lookout for threats like salmonella and the flu virus. And what these cells do is if they see a threat, like, for example, this salmonella virus, they use a set of receptors that are called TLRs to detect the presence of that threat. And the, that's this green pathway here. When those receptors are activated, they turn on genes in the nucleus that um, um, encode proteins that you need to respond to those viruses. That's this blue dot here. That's the first phase of the response, OK? Then in the second phase, the levels of these response proteins, these cytokines, one of them is interferon that you may have heard of. So this is the interferon receptor here, IFNAR. The levels of those proteins are very, very dramatically elevated, right? That's what you need to respond to the virus. That's what makes your nose run when you're infected with the virus, because you're actually fighting the virus, all right? This is the response phase, all right? You need this. But this is a very, very explosive reaction. And if you don't control it, you stay like the guy who's, who's permanently, uh, permanently has the flu. What we found is that this same blue pathway here turns on the expression of our red TAM receptors. Those red TAM receptors latch on to the blue receptors. They send a signal back to the nucleus, which turns on inhibitors, which inhibit the response and the recognition pathway. And when those inhibitors are active, you return the cell to baseline. Okay? So what you actually have is a cycle of inflammation, in which you have these three phases, this green recognition phase, the blue response phase, which mobilizes the innate immune system, and then this red phase, which our TAM receptors control. Okay? Now, before we did this analysis, before we cloned these receptors, immunologists didn't even know that they were expressed in the cells, and they didn't know that they controlled this process. But this is, in fact, fundamental to your ability to go on after an infection. I always, many biologists and many folks in general, when they think about how biology works, they're very often concerned with how you respond to a threat, how you see that threat, what you do. But it is a truism in biology, as in many things, that if you have the ability to turn something on, you must have the ability to turn it off. To get here tonight, most of you had to know how to turn your car on and make it go forward. But unless you're going to be spending the rest of the evening and the rest of your life circling around the freeways of, of San Diego, you also have to know how to stop the car when you get to where you want to be. That's what the TAM receptors do. If you can't do that, you're like the sorcerer's apprentice, right? In that you set in motion a chain of events. So this Mickey here has cast a spell over this broom to make him do a job that he really wants to do. That actually was a very good thing for Mickey and for the sorcerer's apprentice. But in fact, he didn't know how to stop it. So if you're the sorcerer's apprentice, you set in motion a chain of events over which you have no control. And it is, in fact, the TAMs that prevent that from happening. That's what we discovered. As many of you will know, chronic inflammation, that is to say staying in this activated response continuously, underlies a whole series of human diseases. Not only autoimmunity, but as was, was highlighted in this Time Magazine article from 2004, heart attacks, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, 
Many, many of these afflictions in human beings are associated with chronic inflammation. And so our discovery of this pathway, and here's sort of a more, this is still a cartoon for a scientist. I know it looks pretty intimidating, but it's still a cartoon. We actually know a great deal about the molecular circuitry and the mechanics of this process. In terms of this pathway, the only thing you have to think about is, again, we're talking about green recognition, blue response, red resolution, red inhibition. If you have, this is, this is the sentinel cells in your body, this is the circuitry in those cells. If you don't have this red system and you give a stimulus through this pathway, then the cell is trapped in this responsive state. And that's why in our mice that don't have these TAM receptors, any time they get an immune stimulus, they get an infection, they hyper-respond to that infection. Many of you will know that for people with autoimmune diseases, for example, women with lupus, one of the worst things that can happen to them is for them to catch a cold because that will almost always be followed by a lupus flare. And we think that's because in lupus patients that have chronic um, elevation of this pathway, you give them a stimulus like a cold virus, they don't have enough inhibition going on, and they, this response here, this blue pathway, is, is, is too strong. So then let me just finish by giving you just a few examples of how we're extending this, these discoveries, these sort of basic science dis discoveries at the Salk into potential new therapies for people. And I'll talk just about two autoimmune diseases. We're actually trying to work this up in three different contexts. In the context of multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune disease where your own immune system attacks your components of the central nervous system. In inflammatory bowel diseases like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And then finally, in lupus. Let me just say first um, a little bit about lupus. So the proteins that activate our two TAM receptors, there are two um, proteins which normally turn those inhibitors on. They are proteins called GAS6 and protein S. And there's actually, in terms of, as I said, in the, our, our knockout mice have all these features of lupus. But in fact, in patients, in, in, in SLE patients, SLE is just an acronym for lupus, there are over 300 reports in the medical literature of decreased levels of protein S in these patients. Here's a very recent one, which is, was just published within the last month. The title says, TAM receptor ligands, protein S, but not GAS6 levels, reflect disease activity in systemic lupus erythematosus. So there's, a, in fact, a very big literature on this. Protein S um, is, in addition to being a TAM ligand, is also an important anticoagulant in the blood coagulation cascade. And many women with lupus first come into the clinic with problems in blood clotting because they have low levels of protein S. Well, they also have chronic inflammation because protein S, this protein that stimulates our TAM inhibitors, is too low. There's a similar medical literature, not as big, but also in inflammatory bowel diseases. So like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, these very nasty diseases where you have inflammation of the intestine. It turns out that this is an intestine of a mouse. This white signal here you see is protein S, one of the proteins that turns on our TAM receptors in the intestine. It's there at very, very high levels. If we look to see whether this is biologically important, we can do an experiment with this compound here called DSS, which induces inflammation in the intestine normally. And if we do this in a normal mouse, a normal mouse for biologists is called a wild-type mouse. That's WT here. We can give a dose of DSS for two weeks, which every member of this cohort of wild-type mice will survive. This is a survival curve here. So 100% of the mice survive. If we do the same experiment in the TAM triple knockouts, every single mouse is killed by this treatment. And this is because the mice cannot control, because they don't have any TAMs, they can't control the inflammation that's induced by this stimulus. It's yet another example of that pathway. So I'll finish up there and just say that we are now moving um, on in many directions on this front. In terms of therapies, we're trying to prepare and generate in the lab what are called recombinant versions of these ligands, other ways to activate this system, and then to test those uh, recombinant versions of proteins in animal models for autoimmune disease, like animal models for multiple sclerosis.